Yes, guys, welcome back to the Canon Podcast. I am back from Gran Canaria having drunk, I think, all the alcohol on the island. So unfortunately, if you're there now, unfortunately, there is none available. Um, but I'm back. Is that a big the- island for those for those that don't know? What, what, what is Gran Canary? It's a good question, George. Um, did I did I explore the island? Uh, <laughs> I'll be honest. Grand Canary. Not particularly. It's part of the Canary Islands, and mm-hmm. they speak Spanish. Uh, it's like sort of Tenerife. It's like off the I'll coast. I'll go Tenerife. Hey, when? Yeah, uh, soon enough. I think maybe next month. Babs was at Coldplay last night. <laughs> yes, co- not last night. I was I was out all day yesterday, mate. I was a uh, it was it was a BBC Radio One concert. Not concert. It's a it's a festival. It's my first proper festival. My shoes. I went with white shoes. They came yeah. back looking brown. Mistake. So um, so um, yeah yeah. Big decision. problems. But Coldplay is good. Do you know who was next to you, by the way? Coldplay is funny because we're we're like in the middle of the crowd, obviously. So it's not like seating anywhere. You just kind of stand where you want. Walking by us is Chris MD. Really? Wow. Yeah, just walk, Who's taller? Are you or Chris MD? We're the same height. We're the same height. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Chris are the same height. So, uh, Do you know what? Yeah, Chris MD decision. is yeah. such a good YouTuber. He's so good. He is. Good, Chris man. MD is. He's so he's consistent so as well. He's so and he's an Austin fan. Yeah. Should we get yeah, on yeah. the pod? Let's do it. Let's get on the pod. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, you can check us out, by the way, on Spotify and Apple. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, of course. And you can find us, you can find us everywhere. Um, and we're also going to be doing a live Q&A for our patrons and YouTube members on Saturday at 2 p.m. So if you want to sign up for that, there is also a free trial on Patreon if you want to sign up for that. Sign up for that. But uh, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Um, we're going to talk FA Cup. Mm. El Baldico. Ten Hag <laughs> beat won. Pep. Unbelievable. Um, there's lots to sort of discuss from an Arsenal perspective, which we'll come to. Um, but in terms of the game itself, uh, Bowser will come to you first. Um, a, 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 an upset, a shock. Yeah. Very, uh, look, it's annoying. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you, not just annoying because United won and, you know, United and Arsenal rivals. It's the fact that City were awful. They were poor. They were punished. And I'm thinking, these robots, all we needed was a game like this just, just a couple weeks earlier. And the worst thing is they had that game, um, the Forest game, where they conceded so many chances. Chris Mood missed chance off the chance, even the Spurs game where they weren't amazing. <clears throat> and Son was in one one and he missed the chance. They were punished in this game. I think, see, uh, look, City fans themselves will admit that this season they weren't on their levels of previous years, even though they won a title for it and, it's, and it's four in a row. And and it's crazy to even say that that's their level when fans, they, they think they're underperforming. The reality is they haven't been as consistent as they were in previous years or as, you know, I guess perfect. You know, there were some imperfections there. And this game, United exposed it on the counter-attack with some really good pace in behind, Garnacho and even Rashford and, and Kobe Mino. I mean... That guy's, that guy's, that guy's a, he's a good baller he's yeah. a very good baller see the Paul Scholes comments when he said like he's like 10 times the player that I was at 19 it's crazy he, he's, a, he's a top player he's a top player um, George unfortunately though it looks like Ineos are going to make um, the right decision <laughs> well the wrong decision from our perspective but the right decision from United's perspective and sack Ten Hag I get a bit of a foreboding sense from Ineos um, and we'll come to sort of our, how the, the league sort of looks later, but just specifically on, on Ten Hag and Ineos, I mean, right call, cool, surely, to get rid of Ten Hag, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of the problem with Ten Hag is when you don't perform and have a philosophy that your players buy into, your club or your fans buy into, then you're always going to struggle from the get-go. And I think part of the issue is that um, I, I think there's a new trend in modern football, to be honest with you, that style and attributing a vision a philosophy is is the new craze because i mean if you have a look at it there are so many clubs that are in transition at this moment in time you talk about barca the entire fiasco about xavi being sacked then xavi being re-signed then going to hansi flick then going all the way to bayern in terms of the amount of managers that were rejected at that club and then finally setting on a vincent company who has just been relegated with burnley and for all you know, intensive purposes have been one of the poorest teams in the league, despite having a positive style. And then you go to Eric Ten Hag, where throughout the entirety of the season, um, they've shown an incapability to defend. They've shown a capability to essentially allow the most shots on their goal more than anyone in the league, including Sheffield, which is just not okay. So when you're talking to me about results and signings, I don't think that was sustainable. I think that even with good recruitment and the uh, most deluded statements by the man himself, I don't think there's been a more deluded manager it's in crazy. the league. Because it is crazy. Because the amount of times he's referenced the Arsenal win from even the fact of, you know, even if Inyo signed me, I'm going to go on a holiday and be fine because I've been to 
three finals and won two trophies in my time here. I'm going to be fine. Mate, you, you conceded the most shots in the league with one of the biggest squads in the world. Uh, that's not okay. And so I think um, the reason I bring this up is because I think that there's been a real big divide where fan culture has always demanded trophy success outcome. By those metrics, Ten Hag would still be in the job. Uh, but, you know, I, I think play style, uh, underlying statistics, the so-called nerd effects, and when everyone's going, here comes the monologue, those things have won in recent times. And by the way, they're winning not just at Manchester United, they're winning at Bayern, they're winning at Barcelona, they're winning in the biggest clubs in the world. And I'm going about a big roundabout way just to say, Mikel, you changed your lives. And <laughs> I say that kind of jokingly. Yeah, no, but I kind of don't. No, we we found we found something very special, and we and we know. I think Babs in one, one of your one of your many um, uh, what's the word? How, how would I put it? Uh, oh, it's been a baits, successful week on X. Baits of it the Chelsea been a United successful fans. Week on X. I think you did say uh, you know everyone's looking for their own Arteta, but it's kind of true. And I think George, what you're saying is is bang on in that owners are thinking differently. They're thinking in very very different terms now, and they, and they are looking at more sustainable terms of success because they have they have to. And you know this is why annoyingly. Uh, any else have, have probably made the right call, but you know, Babs, maybe maybe to come to that because I do think it is it is interesting. What what do you think people are looking for? Because it you know it feels like in this sort of merry go round of managers, there is this there is this search for something. We're not go the, mm. you know clubs aren't looking for they're not just getting Mourinho back in anymore. They're not doing Big Sam anymore. You know that those types of managers aren't there, and I think a lot of it is communication. And I think what we, you're saying about uh, Ten Hag as well, there, George, is is, is true. The guy just can't. It's, I think I've said this. I might have said this before on the, on the pod. I can't remember, but his communication. We're, we're so lucky with Arteta that he both has the football ideas and the ability to get it across to the media. You don't always get those, and I think clubs are really looking for that. Not only managers who are you know good on the training pitch and you know can get a dressing room together, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also deliver a message to the fans. And I think you know there's certain managers who have it and certain managers who don't. We're very lucky to have one. But even Vinny Company. I think his communication skills partly have landed have been way more important than they would have been say 20 years ago in landing him that buying job. He can tell people what he wants to do and that's so important for the modern for the modern manager and for the modern owners and modern fans. I think a lot of it depends on what you're asking for. Fans want bragging rights. You know, and it's mainly because they can flex to other fans. Look, we got a trophy. We had a better season than you. Speak um, for yourself. But if you ask it, yeah, no, I've, and, and I know that more than anyone because I've been on Twitter for a very long time and I know how it works nowadays. And that's why I'm, I, I kind of know what I'm doing with that. But specifically in terms of like even outside outside of uh, social media and fans, it, you you'll you'll have United fans come up to you, you know, and they'll say to you, "We had a better season." So I asked them a question of, "Okay, so you keep Tenog?" Then? No, we're not keeping Tenog. We've got standards. Okay, so you can fight for title next season. No, we can't fight for title next season. You know, uh, we're gonna have to trust the process again so it's it's weird it is a very much a bragging rights thing for fans but in terms of the clubs they want to have sustained success but also sustained progress and you look at Arsenal we've had our very linear progress every year we've got slightly better and sometimes very very much better a lot of clubs they go up and they go down you look at my United as the best example last year third place finish you won the Carabao Cup surely from that moment you go and sign a few plays kick on from there but you finish eighth you go back a step. And a lot of clubs, that they want that sustained progress every year. Our style is getting better. Our style is getting closer. And the goal is, you know, to, to end up like a Man City, like a Real Madrid. Sustained success, sustained com uh, com competition and stuff. And you're competing for a title every single year. And that's why I look at United fans right now and who, who say to me, you know, as an Arsenal fan, we've had a better year than you. I'm going, fair enough to you guys. You've won your trophy. But come the start of next season, when it comes to the big boy conversation of a title, you're not going to beat it. We are. And we, we're almost the only hope for the league right now to go and stop a, a five in a row city and a guy who's, uh, who's about to say goodbye. Yep. Yes, and uh, we'll maybe come to that later. But I, I want to come to the game itself because I thought there was some interesting stuff in there. I, for, first and foremost, I thought United, I, I would give them some credit. I was doing a watch along actually for the first time and it was interesting like trying to sort of work out what was going on. Did you like, go I, had, I, I went full, what's going on? <laughs> Kobe Mainu. Um but you know I had to go. <laughs> so bad, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but uh, <laughs> human jukebox strikes again. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the um, yeah, you know, I, I was sort of trying to work my way because obviously you're trying to explain it to an audience. You have to like speak it out loud. It's quite an interesting experience. And what I sort of I I, I think United actually did pretty well, and they played in a similar way to the way they played against us, 
in a way, it's kind of annoying because they had a bit of a practice at Old Trafford a couple of weeks ago uh, before this game. But the two, I think it was Fernandez and McTominay on the day, and then Rashford and Garnacho either side, and that sort of that mid block. And it was an interesting setup. I, I thought, honestly, I think Pep himself said, uh, <laughs> who am I to question Pep? But I think he got it wrong. Um, I think he put too many, too many men behind the ball. And then by the time he changed it and started being a bit braver between the lines, essentially, I think what happened is the game had already opened up because the first goal had gone. So it was an interesting one. But George, I want to come to kind of how this all affects Arsenal. Mm-hmm. And I can't help but see in that Man City game, uh, us against Porto, us against Aston Villa, Fulham. us against Fulham in those types of games, and us. By the way, it didn't hurt us, but us against Man United as well. We, you know, we went on and won that game, but we didn't play our our kind of fluid best. So it was interesting one kind of watching that and seeing another team struggle. How do we see mid blocks moving forward in terms of both Arsenal, um, but also as a, as a as a league wide trend? Do you think this is going to be the way you you sort of stop the, the likes of Man City and Arsenal and so on? To me, it's going to be the slow progression into a low block by other teams. And so um, what do I mean by that is uh, teams right now, uh, they're they're caught between two minds. There are so many high possession models. There's so many high possession teams in the league right now. Everybody wants the front foot. And when you're facing a team of just pure quality that you know that it's going to be a lot larger than yours, you're going to find teams that either are comfortable defending their box or if they want to be a bit braver and they want to be a little bit, maybe they know that their quality is not the top of the elite, like the arsenals, the cities, they're going to increase their line of engagement slightly into this mid block and say, we're going to be a bit braver. We're going to try to squeeze the space that you want to uh, find the ball to arrive in, as opposed to maybe squeezing the space that, you know, would defend our own box. And in that way, it is a little bit of a smart tactic because I feel that you take away the kryptonite or, not the kryptonite, but you know the superpower of a lot of these big sides, which is let me dominate zone 14. Let me dominate that area just above the box in order to pen you in. Because we've increased our line here, you're offside beyond that line. So we're asking you to find different solutions. We're asking you to find different passing solutions. And the game becomes a lot more vertical, or at least the demand does. And it's, can you adapt to be that vertical? And that's been the question, I think, for a lot of bigger teams. And it, and it starts to highlight a lot of different asks in the game. We talk about long switches after isolated 1v1s. We start to talk about half space crossing becoming significantly increased. We start to Ca- talk carries about- Carries as well uh, would, would be something ab- for me. Absolutely. I think like somebody like uh, a Jamal Musiela, ironically at Bayern, when we struggled, you find a player in that ability to carry, but you're not talking, by the way, your volume passers. You're talking about transition carriers, and it's not just speed, by the way. People sometimes misinterpret when I start to talk about transitional inevitability. They've seen it now adopted on Don't Twitter. Don't use such crazy words like yeah. transitional inevitability, George, because <laughs> Liverpool fans will accuse you of overcomplicating the game. A hundred percent. But uh, I, I think um, the biggest clubs have foreseen this problem, though, by the way. When did, when did City get Holland? When did Liverpool get Nunez? When, you know, when you start to look at it, I think across the league, coaches have seen that teams are now going to attempt to stop you more in those zones. The problem is, despite having those solutions, you still have to have the quality to find them in the right moment. And that's when the inevitability or rather the efficiency comes in. The decision making about when to go wide, when to switch long into the underloaded side, when to start maybe doing some half space crossing. It does require both a recruitment sense where you have somebody that's a strong gravitational runner. So somebody that, you know, not only has searing pace, but has the ability to hold off challenges and can also draw a large portion of the defenders to a particular area. You know, they have to have that physical gravity because if they don't, then and it, you're just relying on pace, then I think your distances and especially your goalkeeper now is going to be super important about closing those distances. And the pace of pass has to be perfect. And in those conditions, you have to have almost the perfect situation fall off for you to succeed. And that happens once, twice a match. And so it's not repeatable. It's not sustainable. So in terms of finding a tactic, I do think that half space crossing is going to become something of a new demand in the modern sport. It's going to be something that we're going to need to find more of. But also you start to talk about your Rashfords. You start to talk about your Nunez, your Hollands. What do they all have in common? They have that transitional inevitability. And I start to ask myself, where, where's Arsenal's? Because we're yeah. going to find this yeah. mid-block problem and we're going to have to find our own. Yeah, I, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to come to because 
in terms of solutions to this. So if we if we I, I feel at the moment, Babs, that Arsenal are kind of set up to be a team that pin you back in your in your own third. They could they're a team that essentially are you know really good in terms of the combinations on the uh, on the right hand side uh, you know and how sort of Erdegaard and Saka and White combine those overlaps and those cutbacks and you know we've we've seen it you remember the Newcastle game you know we, we remember that those sorts of combinations when it works it really works but where I worry about us is when Gabriel and Saliba are having lots of touches the team are, you know in the same way United did very narrow and compact and and sort of stepped up on us and asking us to find different solutions as George has kind of pointed out they are um, sort of transition threat in terms of you know half space crosses etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I would also highlight uh, carrying and switching as well as George said. Um, is that something you think we have in the team with a timber? Let's say with the with the carries with say you know moving Erdegaard uh, possibly to, to fav- favor angles in terms of the half space crossing, um, or as I imagine we, we all feel, is this something we need to find in the market with uh, with with new midfielders mm. and new forwards? I think it's something that I'm looking to add to the, to the team for sure. And that means that I don't feel like we have it consistently. We've got the yeah. quality. You know, we see it at times. We've seen Erdegaard play at times, drift over to the left half space and just whip across him to the far post. And we've seen he can do it, but he doesn't do it consistently. Now, you look at Man City, you look at even Man United, Bruno Fernandes and Kevin De Bruyne, these players do it every single game. Yeah. And that's why if you look at, you know, the, the big chance created. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you look at big chance created metrics, you know, Fernandes is always like, supreme in that he's always got like 30 per season and that's because he's able to find passes and take risks on the ball and I don't feel like we've got a designated risk taker you know Bakayo can do it for sure and so can Odegaard but he's not like a go-to every game give the ball to him he's going to make the pass and he's going to find the and it's, it was meant to be Fabio Vieira you know that's meant to be his strength and we've seen it in very small glimpses the example actually from the half space maybe was against Fulham uh, early season where he whipped it at Eddie Nketiah a supreme ball and that's the type of quality we need on a consistent basis but we don't know if he's even going to be a part of our first team next season so it's something that I want to add but if Mikel sees it inside the squad then it, and it is Fabio Vieira or it is Martin Odegaard we need to put them in the environment to you know continue to do it and playing Odegaard on the right it's not going to happen you know you're not going to find that consistent halfway crossing but if you move them over the left hand side and tweak it a little bit you can potentially get more of it more often so it's something that I want to add but I don't really see a player on the market right now that I'm going, he's the De Bruyne, he's the Fernandez, And we've got one in Martin Odegaard that gets put in the same category. I think he's slightly different. I think he's more of a midfielder than he is a final third action player. Um, and I feel like, you know, if, you, if you've got Fabio Vieira, we have to ask the question of when, he, when are you going to... I, I was gonna when, he, when is he going to be the player I, we're going to turn to? And it's not just him, because when you're talking about squad management, mate, like we're talking about the mid-block problem and the solution. You just asked for a, a carrier. Right, Alex? Mm. Who, who fits that yeah, description? But... Emil yeah. Smith Rowe. You, uh, you want to ask? You, you want to ask for half space crossing? Who fits that description? Fa- Fabio Vieira. Our squad management of these assets, even if you don't believe in them, they are needed solutions to what is going to be inevitably a big problem next season. So I think just not even just looking at the market, but looking at people that are going to effectively be able to contribute to these aspects of play is going to be important. I think we have the people that get us to the point of breaching the line. What I don't have confidence in is having enough players to finish the action there. I actually don't question our ability to maybe find those solutions because I think we have the assets. They're underutilized assets and maybe we're not using them correctly, but we have the assets. The problem for me is I don't have my finisher that makes the right decisions in those moments that I can reliably say 1v1 in Bayern, in the Champions League, we've breached the line. Is he going to seal it in that moment? Is he going to have the Rashford moment in the FA Cup? Because those don't come out very often when you employ those the, those tactics. So you have to be clinical. And that's something that Barbakai Osaka, who I think is probably my, my most uh, confident player in those areas, I don't know if I've got one in Arsenal that I'm super, super confident in. I like the phrase Babs used, designated risk taker. I really like that. I think... Um... I think like uh, when teams are asked different questions, there's going to be new solutions. And I think it may well be that. And this is why I'm, the likes of Eddie Nketiah and Reese Nelson and stuff, I, I'm kind of, I'm okay to see the back of. This is the reason I have question marks over Smith, Rowe and Vieira, because I know that they have things that we don't have. The problem is, is, you know, when, when we're being asked different, different, you know, when we're being asked different questions next season, it may well be that they have their moment and they sort of, they shine and they come into the team and we, we see sort of a, a new side of them and they, and they pick up form, et cetera, et cetera. But I think at the minute, I don't know whether they have enough to their all round game. This is why it was so exciting to see what Smith Rowe did against Luton. 
I don't know why it was, you know, if he can do that, then mate, we, we've got that in the squad. It's just the question of doing it consistently. So yeah, it, it's funny because it may be, maybe in another scenario, you'd be shipping them off. But because of what I guess we're anticipating next season being our problem, you're looking at Vieira and Smith and you're going, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. But let's come to the market because um, we mentioned him there. Marcus Rashford uh, and at AFC Amden tweeted yesterday that um, Arteta... Um, oh, so it was Camden. Where's the C? No, I know. As in, I didn't. I just didn't clock there was no two Cs. Because oh, right. I, I read Camden, not Amden. Who's, who's oh, like Amden, AF Camden. Yeah. It could be AF Camden. No, Some it has to be my, my Who read my Twitter name and put Amon. Like, why would it be Amon? Anyway, <laughs> um... Uh, but yeah, uh, he uh, tweeted out supposedly that uh, Rashford and Arteta uh, have had conversations. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But look, this is a player that, you know, the, the name is circling Arsenal at the minute. I think we should talk about it but, uh, based on the back of that conversation. Um, and we've spoken about it before, obviously. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a funny one because Rashford, there's so many reasons. Financially, this could just be a complete non-starter. And I completely understand that. But my, my approach to this is this. I feel like there's about 30, maybe less players in world football who can improve our first 11 right now. And then when you ask, okay, uh, are they available? Are they in the right contract situation? Are they, um, you know, it does our test like them. Are they going to block the squad? You know, wages are going to be... If you start to ask the sort of suitability questions... Guys, we're dealing with a very, very small list. So any when a name comes up that we think hmm, that seems to quite make sense, I don't just want to go no straight away. I, I don't, I don't really believe in that. I don't think we can do that anymore because the list of players that we have available to us for me is decreasing and getting smaller and smaller. I think it's about deciding what problems we want for me. And going, you know, because no player is going to come with no issues. But, you know, it's like, okay, are the problems that we want availability problems? Probably not. Are the problems that we want suitability problems? Probably not. Are the problems we want adaptability problems? Well, maybe so. I don't know. So you can kind of choose the choose the problems that you're going to have or question marks about mentality, et cetera, et cetera. George, I'll come to you on this, on Rashford first. Um, I just... I can't get past the fact, and maybe I'm overrating Rashford and you can tell me if um, tell me if I am. I can't get past the fact that I genuinely believe both Pep and Arteta this season have changed the way they play based on Marcus Rashford, in part. He's also supported by the way Manchester United have played. But if I look at the FA Cup final, Pep is not putting that many, behind, many men behind the ball without the transition threat of Rashford and Garnacho. If I look at the game we played at the Emirates, Arteta is not playing in that way without the transition threat of Rashford. I don't see top coaches adapting. And again, that's also the way Ten Hag wants to play. So he's he's using them in, in, in the best possible way. But when a coach that we respect that much is changing their entire game model to do something different and uh, to, 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 de- to deal with that, obviously in a very obvious way, and I'm sure they do it with other players, I have to look at that. I have to look at that and say, is there something there if we can get the deal done? And that's a whole different conversation. Part of the issue with that is it's Eric Ten Hogs Manchester United who yeah, can't yeah, build yeah. up, who can't go oh, no, between the lines. And so from a coaching perspective, the sit off actually it isn't respect. It's actually embarrassment. It's actually uh you're, you're it's cockiness, I'll be honest with you. It's like we will let you have the ball. No when has Mikel and Pep ever done that? You know, they, if if anything, their game plans are built on stopping the flow from the goalkeeper that's really been the the yeah i think i think it's a dual i think it's a dual benefit i i know what you mean but i i do i do feel there are other teams who struggle to build up that they don't do that against a a bit but um i i don't know if it's marcus rashford i think the name isn't necessarily the threat but the description of what he is as a player is and that's why i say it's it's a physical outlet that those will always garner respect to a certain degree. Look at uh, Forest, for example, and the way they play. Now Crystal Palace, by the way, with Glasner, um, it's not just been an uptick by managerial performance, but look at what they have in terms of Eze, um, in terms of Olize, in terms of even Mateta. Um, you know, you you look at that Forest side, you know, Callum hudson Adoy, Awanihi, Langa, um, you know, you look at these types of teams, even West Ham in terms of Jared Bowen, Kudas, Paqueta, 
what 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 are common amongst all these mid table teams and it's their ability to have physical outlets and that for me is what changes the game a, a lot and um on Marcus Rashford I think there are a lot of off the pitch questions that I have um in terms of feasibility in terms of uh, in terms of united even be willing to sell I mean think of the PR for one moment I don't think we can completely ignore it Revenge I don't want to highlight person. it I but yeah, I mean, a homegrown Mancunian boy coming to win the title at one of your biggest rivals, that is a PR nightmare. I don't think I've seen, look, we've had some embarrassments. Probably Ashley Cole is the closest thing that Arsenal have had. And look how long that's taken for us to get rid of. So I, I, you can't ignore it. But on the pitch, that boy, if you're doubting that ability and that um, game-breaking quality, then I question your ability of being genuine and intellectually honest yep, because that is a profile that you're looking to have. The problem that I've got is I think that you have to start asking your questions, mate. What are your non-negotiables to a transfer? And some of the things that Marcus Rashford does for me do hinge on those non-negotiables. For example, out of possession, is he able to contribute to the team and to the press? I've seen the physical qualities. I've never seen the motivation for him to be able to diligently track runners and to do it over a sustained period of time. Now, you're asking yourself, can Mikel give you a coaching ability to do so? You'd hope so. But is that innate in him? We ask our wingers to do three times the defensive work of every superstar in the world. If you're already starting at a baseline that doesn't do it to a level of even good or average, then you're going to start asking questions, does that hurt our game model? Because we ask for exceptional out of possession, work rate, diligence. And so you do have to make a jump. And that's something that I think is, again, an off the pitch question, because I haven't seen it on the pitch. But when I'm asking myself, do you have the motivation to? That's you asking the character, you getting to know them. And that's something that I can't answer from my screen all the way off in Canada. The problem is, I think when you start to isolate Marcus Rashford, there is enough questions where there's going to be some fans that are saying, are we doing another Save Me project? Is this another Havertz? In Havertz, we got, a, I'd argue, a mentality and a character that is soft-spoken but determined, soft-spoken but able to adapt, and soft-spoken but able to show you different sides that he hasn't shown you at previous clubs where he's failed. And so we've recruited a character, and I think Mikel has alluded to this before, that shows a capability to learn, that is coachable. That for me needs to yep. be the biggest pillar question mark if we're talking about outlets that you have question marks over. And if you can guarantee a level of coachability, you can guarantee a level of success, in my opinion. I hear that. I do hear that. I, I certainly hear that about the out possession work. It's, it's just a massive question mark. And, you know, we haven't, we literally haven't seen him do the, the amount yeah. of out possession work, you know, so I can't sit here and say he, he, he could or could. For years. And he's been in the league exactly. for so long. Hundred percent. I will add a small caveat that I think a lot of the a lot of the clips that come out of Rashford that people are probably thinking of right now and saying he doesn't he doesn't try. Eric, the distances he has to run in Eric's in whole system are, are crazy. However, that's not you know th that's this season. So you you've know, got Ole, you've got Moyes, you've got yeah, so yeah, yeah, many yeah, people, yeah. and even um even Van Gaal. You know, yeah, yeah. ironically. I also, um, no, but I also feel like it's, what, what is it for? So for Arsenal, when you're running that hard, you know, the rest of the team's doing it and you're going for a title. For United, he's never been in a team that's going for big honours. He's always been going for top four and FA Cup. So the desire, it wouldn't be there, you know? It's only because we're going uh, for Man City that we have that desire to really push beyond levels yeah. that, you know, others are not at. I was listening to um, uh, Faisal on Latte Firm talking about this. And I think they kind of bring up a, an interesting question about sort of, you know, a bad apple or whatever. I think there's two things here. Firstly, environments are king. Environments are king. When you put people in position, you see a Granite Xhaka, guys. You know, absolutely, you know, I thought at one point in my Arsenal sporting journey, one of the worst players I've ever seen in an Arsenal shirt, by the way, just scored the winning goal in the DFB Pokal final, just went on an unbeaten run with Leverkusen because they put him in the right positions. And when you put someone in the right positions, you allow them to flourish. It's like, you know, asking... I don't know. It's like, it's like asking me to run 100 meters. Like, it's just it's just no point. But get me chatting, and we're we're fine. Do you know what I mean? Put people in the right positions, and they will deliver for you. So I think it's it's environments are king, and I think he's not been always in the right environments for him to flourish. And secondly, what they were saying on Latifone was this idea that he's going to sort of come in and and just destroy the culture. How how sort of how brittle do you think the culture is? 
If one mm. person can come in and completely destroy everything. And by the way, this would be after Mikel being sure that he was the right guy. This would be, you know, after the the, the question marks about wages are answered, after they've had outside the possessions, outside, you know, after they've had conversations, etc. If he did come in, people go, but he's just going to destroy the restroom. Hang on a minute. How soft do you think our culture is? We've got a dog, guys. We've got a tree. Um, <laughs> but no, like, you know, how soft do you think the culture is <laughs> that one person could come in? And also... We all know this. We all know when you're with your family, you're a very different person to the person you are when you're with your friends. And you're a very different person to the person you are when you're at school, at work, et cetera, et cetera. You adapt, you change depending on the culture that you're in. We're social animals and creatures. The idea that, you know, he isn't professional or he's, you know, he's this horrible person off the pitch, I just can't buy particularly. But but as I come to you on the sort of overall thoughts on this in general, but also maybe tee you up as well with this, the wages feel prohibitive but for me this was all you know if this is going to work and i by the way full transparency i can't see it working but if it was going to work i think rashford would would have to take a pay cut but i think there's a world yeah. in which he might say do you know what i'm 26 i want to win something i'm ha- I'm happy to do that if that's what makes it work but there's a way in contracts that you can you know add in clauses that if you reach a certain level you get extra money, you know, incentivize him for that because we know that what he can produce. So produce that level and you'll get that level of money. And so I feel like wages definitely would be a stumbling block, but if we can negotiate with him and also sell him the dream of a, a title, not just one title, by the way, if Pep is going and Pep is going at the, at the end of the season, there's more than one there for sure. There's potentially an area of dominance and for a player of his caliber and the careers at United so far, he's won what one or two FA Cups, he's won the Europa League, you know, he's got more in his locker. And if you can look at the likes of Saka and look at the likes of Erdegaard and Rice and the players that Arsenal have and the platform he can be given to not just become a superstar in the Premier League, but in the world again, respect and also go to the Euros. I mean, this is a guy that's not going to go to the Euros. That's crazy. Considering last year he scored 30 plus goals for a United side that we know now aren't anything special. So that's why even with Arsenal fans that we talk about Rashford now, they go, no, no chance. If you ask Arsenal fans at the end of last season, Rashford, they're going to take him in a heartbeat. So it is a lot of right now emotional. We've seen him for one season. It's very recency bias. But I feel like, you know, in terms of what he's shown us in the past and that quality, that player, as George keeps saying, up against Bayern Munich, up against Real Madrid, look at their fans. Who do they fit? You know, and, you know, we've seen Bayern fans say, oh, Saka's fearful, but we don't have another player on top of that. Imagine you've got Marcus Rashford running in behind. You've got Saka on one side, Rashford on the other side. You can play Rashford down the middle as well. He's, got, he's a versatile player. You need to play on the right times. And he's only 26 years of age, you know? So... He is a player that if you can just fix a little bit, that is a superstar there. And there's very few players that we have that were, we, we turned the likes of Odegaard that became a superstar, but we haven't signed players that have that superstar talent. They've got work rate, but they've worked themselves to a level. Well, Rashford has that natural talent. We just need to add the work rate towards it. And off the ball concerns, I see them, but look, let's not forget, before before we signed uh, Havertz, that was our major concern with Havertz, yep. is can he work off the ball? Exactly. Can he do the off the ball work? And we can see now he can do the off the ball work. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know there is. I know this get, gets joked about, but to some degree, if if the professionals are, are sure he can do that, then who am I to say? I want to sort of pivot, George, to maybe a, a wider conversation just about the market because I suppose what are we trying to do with Rashford? Like, let's forget the name a second. Mm-hmm. Like, what are we really trying to fix here? We're trying to fix a, a kind of a level of superstardom, the transitional stuff that we were speaking about earlier, probably some height, definitely some pace. Uh, that, th- that sort of fear factor, and and this is the thing with the the, na- the reason the name Rashford keeps coming up is because he ticks a lot of those boxes. Now the, the sort of business side of things, and the, there's there's a lot of other questions around it, but he ticks a lot of those boxes. And this is kind of my issue: is that people will say no, and that's fine. And genuinely, like if you're watching this, you're like, absolutely not Rashford. I I can't like I, I completely get it. I completely get it, and I don't think it will happen. But I think you know what, but, mate. But sorry, but sorry to interject, not- but maybe put a name that has a little bit better Leao has the same question game breaking yeah. quality like there are players out there that fit the rashford quote end quote and by the yeah. way Leao has a ridiculous release clause there's financial questions there's actually a lot of similarities to me to the Leao rashford being the top two choices by the way for yeah. a position of need yeah yeah I, and i just i look at it and i go we're going okay rashford Leao, whatever and it's funny because in previous windows i've been sat on podcasts or whatever and i've been reeling off names i've been going you know this this player this player this player this player and i get it if people like don't want Leao, don't want rashford or whatever but at some point it's kind of my point earlier we you aren't we, we go we need our de bruyne we need our we need our harland hang on a minute when when city signed de bruyne he wasn't de bruyne he wasn't mm. the guy we think he is now do you know what i mean he, he was 
He come from he was a Chelsea reject. When Liverpool signed Salah, he was a Chelsea reject. So this idea that you're just going to sign this superstar out of nowhere with no questions, forget Rashford, forget Leal, forget the names, to me is a, is fanciful. Do you know what I mean? The probability of you signing that player is very small. And, you know, I think, it, look, I, I share I share your frustration when you talk about transfers because I think part of the problem is everybody, uh, if there was a clear name, it would be common. If there was a clear name, there would be links. If there was a clear name, we saw Declan Rice and we saw yeah, that Rice. pursuit. We saw what that was like. So I don't think the name is clear. Uh, the outcome for me has to be clear. And, you know, I, I'm a person that always at its core wants to talk about <laughs> non-negotiables to a sense, because I think that despite there being questions to every potential transfer, there should be a level of what you're willing to lose. And um, I, I think part of the problem is it's not so much recruiting a bad apple that I'm concerned about. What I'm really concerned about is kind of making sure that what's made us great this season maintains its greatness. And for me, that has to be the out of possession work. I keep going back to it, but I think people don't emphasize it enough. You know, I'm seeing their talk. A lot of people are talking about in possession quality and adding that, for example. But then I'm sitting there and I'm asking myself, okay, between the two teams, who focuses on in possession work more, Pep or Mikel? Pep. Who out of those two teams focuses on out of possession work more? Mikel. In terms of how they set up this season that is drastically different to one another, who has employed a more aggressive man-to-man -man press that's focusing on second ball retrievals? Mikel. Who out of those players, by the way, and who out of those managers um, have employed um, kind of a, a defensive resoluteness that has been the backdrop of their success as opposed to the in-possession centurions yeah, yeah, yeah. that have gone on flair ability keeping what we have yeah and, and and so it's about philosophy for me and that's the struggle that i get so when i ask myself about these marquees by the way that i have question marks for that actually has a bigger red flag and red herring for me because i know the manager that i have if it was pep by the way i think pep's idea of a marquee and a maverick is very different to mikel's idea of a maverick or marquee and what and what you said there about environments being king mate that's part of the that's that's not just part of the environment. It is the environment, and so I, I think if we were talking about layout, by the way, for a Pep, if we were talking about a Marcus Rashford for Pep, I would make the argument. I could see a much better situation of that working out. Look at Doku; he's a maverick in terms of probably to a much lesser quality than these players, but that ability to have basically somebody that will try anything and support that. I've seen that, by the way, at Pep a lot more than I've seen it for Mikel. And the one question I might ask to both of you guys, do Arsenal have an environment to have a Maverick express themselves in that manner um, effectively? Yeah, we, it's another part of the issue. It's another part of the issue. And so um, if you're going to recruit a Maverick, it makes no sense if you don't allow them to be a Maverick. <laughs> and so um, that's that has been a question mark for me. So when I start to look at the marquees, and I hate to circle back to this, but it's why I look at Victor Osaman and I'm kind of okay with a lot of the concessions where he's not perfect either. He's not somebody that's perfect. But the one point of difference that I would put to Victor Osaman to maybe a Marcus Rashford in a layout, besides the positional change, because that's rudimentary, the one difference between the two is that out of possession work. He is probably one of the most selfless marquee forwards that I've seen on the market in terms of running for the team, in terms of contributing to the press, in terms of making selfless runs in the channels. He is somebody that does that work at baseline. And that for me has been always why, well, I have questions about you in terms of your passing ability. You're turning to drop deep. Can you find the pace of pass? Can you work with your association a little bit more? Those are questions that I have with a Victor Osa. I mean, he's not perfect. He's not the only one, but you do answer my minimal rate limiting step, which is, do you contribute out of possession? Are you able to close distances? And are you able to be selfless for the team? Because guys, I look at Kai Havertz, ironically, as a perfect sample size for the save me projects okay the one thing that we've questioned with kai havertz has actually ironically been the in possession work is he aggressive enough on the ball is he able to be decisive in those key moments is he able to kind of put some personality on the ball those are still questions by the way but what you can't question is the boy's work ethic what you can't question is how often he tracks back to the left back how much he's able to be intense in duels, his mentality in terms of approaching Newcastle, his mentality in terms of approaching the out-of-possession work has been unquestionable. 
And that's why, to a certain degree, in my opinion, it's worked or it's yep. been able to work. Yeah. And that's the environment that we show. So I think I question those things um, moving yeah, for forward. Sure. But just to kind of close up on this this little thread then, um, do you think, Mikel, because I think this is, is so important, is that the part of the picture and part of the kind of the maverick that we all want, and we all want this signing or whatever, part of it is Mikel allowing that to happen. To be, to be a maverick, you need to be allowed to do something. <clears throat> Doku's an interesting one because he is like, it's an interesting signing. He's a live wire. He's a live wire. In the, it's almost worth signing a Doku because he is so special at dribbling that maybe you go, do you know what, the other parts of his game is, is kind of fine. So I don't. I suppose what I'm asking is, do you think Mikel will slash needs to make that shift to allow the players to express themselves a little bit more? Because I, I do feel that. I, I feel... The likes of Saka next yeah. season, the likes of even Saliba on the dribble, just little things like that. Just going, do you know what? I'm going to let you do it. Yeah. They, they, we have players that can do it. So we were talking yeah, about yeah. Doku. Gabriel Martinelli used to be one of our biggest Mavericks. I remember when he came through at Arsenal, like he'd beat three, four men, just randomly out of nowhere. And we, and we actually saw it. There was a game earlier this year that he, we were seeing more dribbles as well. There was, I think it was Sevilla at the Emirates where Martinelli had the most dribbles ever. In the Champions League game, and, and we, he went off on that side. So we will see getting times. And we talk about Pep giving you know Mavericks a platform and stuff, and I, and I agree. But also, not really at times. You look at Jack Grealish, look at him at Aston Villa, absolute maverick, taking players on left, right, and centre. At City is, is more of a of a stationary role. So I think ultimately, Mikel Arteta wants as much control as possible of the games, and he wants to control every single scenario. And Mavericks aren't controllable. They're unpredictable. They they sense it in the moment. Okay, in the moment, I want to beat this man this way here. And you can't coach that. And that's why I think Mikel Arteta hasn't really... He wants to know exactly what's going to happen. And that's why he goes for his style of play. Um, but I definitely agree. I want to see a, a mix up a little bit more. But it's a, it's a fine little change. It's not a massive major change I want to see. It's a little a, a, adaptation that he can do. Um, but we've got the place for already. So we talk about Rashford being that player. But Gabriel Martinelli was meant to be that player. In fact, last year, we were comparing Martinelli to Rashford. You know, when he scores 15 league goals and, and sets a, a near record for Brazil, most Brazilian Brazilian goals in a, in a league season. So I think we've got already personal at the club that can do it. And we've not seen them do it so far. So if Mikel Arteta wants that player, he needs to also adapt the system slightly. But I, I don't know if I see that happening as much. I think he'll double down on what he does as it is and try to... Can I ask you guys both, instead. like, what's your, what's your level of allowance? Because, like, uh, I think fundamentally, we're not going to recruit the perfect player. And I, I really do believe if he was out there we'd see more consistent backing and links to it so we're going to recruit somebody that at baseline something about them we don't like as fans by the way there's good so what is your uh, i'm struggling to find the words but what what is your limiting allowance that you need so okay listen i will accept x y and z i will accept you being a brilliant maverick doku dribbler yada yada whatever you want to insert but you need to have this how would you fill in that fill in the blank I think I'm less, I think because of, uh, there was some data, I think it's data analytics, CPL or something like that. I saw some data on Arsenal's um, defensive numbers this season. We're so far out <laughs> in front. <laughs> like we're so good. So there's a part of me that's like, if we dropped 10% in one area, and I know George, you were saying about the out of possession work uh, is, is more of a concern for you. I get that, but for me, I'd be willing to have if we're getting superstar output or so, or something that is you know we we literally don't have in the team. Say let's let's pick Jeremy Doku. Say we could get Jeremy Doku, and we had that sort of live wire that someone who could do that dribbling in a way that basically no one else in world football really can do in the exactly the same way. How sharp his feet are! I mean, w w watching the FA Cup, it's unbelievable. If we drop ten percent just in that position, in terms of the out of possession work, because I'm sure that will be worked on as well. I'd be okay with that. So I think I, I agree with you, George, that there's going to be basically whoever we sign is going to be question marks. For me, if that player is a little bit more naturally selfish and is a little bit more naturally not as strong out of possession, I would be okay with that personally. Do you know what my problem is? And this is a, a Mikel critique, by the way. Bakayo Saka. Why, why are we not getting that from Bakayo Saka? Yeah. Let's ignore transfers for one minute. We've yeah, got 34 like goals that, yeah. and assists. <laughs> and who is the most hardest working player in the team, by the way, that's yeah. shown the most defensive numbers on that same side? Yeah. When you compare him to Ben White, to Martin Odegaard, he clears tackles and interception numbers by both of them in every third of the pitch. He's, he's doing it. And what I worry about 
is, okay, I've got people in my team that you could argue have game breaking quality that have that ability to add you that 10% that could answer some of what we're asking for. And we don't give it, we don't give them that freedom. And so I think that, you know, my goal for next season, by the way, and it's not just a transfer uh, addition is I want to start to prioritize the superstars in our team. I would like to start to platform our superstars because I'm with you, by the way, mate. I don't mind dropping 10% in that outlier quality of second balls if I'm going to guarantee that I'm getting my superstars closer to goal more frequently as possible. But if you can do it in-house, it's it's maybe... Uh, it's maybe, maybe better. better. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Also, like... I look at it in a sense of we're known very much for off the ball quality and we are the best in Europe and that and that's amazing. But if we want to be an all time great side, those sides are known about their on ball quality, what they do with the ball. And you look at City Centurions, you look at the Barcelona side and the Pep Guardiola and you know Mikel Arteta's Invincibles. We don't. I feel like right now we are relying on our hard work ethic and it's amazing to have that. But I want to have more on the ball brilliance and be known for the quality we have with the players rather than just how how we work at times. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess basically the meta question is, is that going to come from external or internal? But we will see. Um, we had news yesterday that Pep yes. might be leaving from, I think it was <laughs> Jack Vaughan in uh, the the Daily Mail. He's a brilliant um, journalist, by the way. That's not some gossip. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so interesting. There's a number of angles to take on this. Why are you still here? <laughs> Firstly, <laughs> just go now. <laughs> What do you have to prove? You're so annoying. <laughs> I think he's leave. trying to be... No, he's not trying to be clever, but like he's going to use this now, isn't he? Like If they were going for five in a row without Pep going next season, they go, okay, well, they're going five in a row. There's no real incentive. Well, now you're leaving, and Pep doesn't want to leave without a title. I'll tell you that for a fact. He does not want to go in his final year without a title. And the idea of his former assistant manager beating him in his final Man City season would hurt him more than you believe. More we than you believe. Yeah. We were yeah. there. And that's why uh, this this <laughs> next year now is just because of that news being set up massively. Because now Pep wants to, not just five in a row, and that's that's obviously insane, but his final season at Man City, he needs that final title. And if we can get in the way of that, and uh, we can get in, uh, we can block that off, I mean, that would set Mikel Arteta light years ahead of everyone else. Yeah, um, it would be huge. I want to come to the, sort of the shape of the league in general, but like, let's just talk Pep first. I suppose the only thing he has is the, I suppose he has the quadruple to go for, for God's sake, um, which hasn't been done before. So, so maybe can we divorce this? I don't know if you guys read there was, I think it's by the charges. <laughs> Santi's magic. Well, yeah, I was about to mention that. Yeah. Santi's magic. I think it was a thread. I've got it on my, if you go on my X page, you can find it. If you scroll down a little bit, it's a thread basically detailing the city charges. And I'd read it. I knew about the charges. I knew basically the overall, but I'd never read the emails. And I knew, like, I knew basically they, it was like the sponsorship money that they'd put through in, in a different way, et cetera. But I'd never read the emails. I'd never read like the full layout of everything. They are done. If this gets found out, they are done. So I don't think this can be um, divorced, Pep's decisions, from that that ruling, which supposedly will come at the end of this year or, or beginning of next. Is it, question to the panel, is it a case that if Pep leaves now, it would be viewed as um, perhaps like he's jumping before the ship sinks? And he can kind of distance himself. Maybe he feels from a, a, an internal position, it's beneficial both on the pitch and off the pitch because you know he, he can go for the quadruple and leave whatever. And but also internally, he can be he can put himself in a position where he can say to the press, as Man City manager, I was not involved in this sort of thing. Question mark. Or is it a case that he genuinely thinks that City are innocent and you know he's just carrying on? <laughs> No, no, he, I, no I, I think he's fully aware about the context of what they've done. I, I think to insult his intelligence, one of the best managers in the world about that is crazy to me. But, 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 but I think he's trying to eke out his ability to basically have a blank canvas. And, you know, at City, he's been able to design, by the way, his perfect team to completely his image, by the way. And, and it's actually why I really don't fear Mikel Arteta ever leaving. He has the power that Pep's got to a certain degree. And these tactical minds, what they do want, look, for them, they believe that the achievements, even if they get charged, by the way, as long as I'm not there under the guise of when they are charged, I'm in the clear. That's how I believe that he thinks. And it's actually why I think he's staying next year, but leaving, because I believe that there's going to be a charge um, next year. But I don't believe that by the time they carry it out, 
it will be enacted next year. I think it'll be for the following season. It's such a big thing that will be drawn out in the courts, that will be fought and arbitrated for so long that the final decision won't happen next season, but it will happen the one following it. And he doesn't want to be involved or around at that point. For him, that's a black mark. And so for him, he's happy to stay as long as that doesn't have the backdrop of his season. And that's not the story of his season. And if he's able to control that, then he's able to continue aspiring to be the best club manager that has ever lived, essentially. Ash Ketchum. Uh, and I think that, you know, it, there's just a certain level of um, uh, kind of freedom that he's allowed in this setup that I don't think exists anywhere else, by the way. Yeah, I and I don't think he'll ever get it anywhere else. It's set up for him. It, re- <laughs> it literally it really was set is. up for him. It really is. So anyways, I I think that's the major reason. I do think the charges have everything to do with his timeline, personally. I think he's been also looking for a way to graciously exit, by the way, as well, after completing it. Because from a sporting objective, you're right, mate. Like He has completed every mountain, uh, Mount Rushmore, if you will, of records. There's no record for him to break. Half the quadruple. Haven't won that, mate. Well, wow. yeah, get out, get in the bin. Like, what are you doing? Standards. It's um. so I just, yeah, I, I, I do think that that's been the reason. And, and uh, I, I, I don't know where he goes from here, by the way. Um, that's one thing that I don't think I've seen anywhere on X. Saudi it, for the Gulf. Well, maybe. I mean, maybe just retire, mate. Like, we're done with you. But um, yeah. is, is internationals away? Is that even something? <laughs> I don't know. Celebrity Big Brother. <laughs> Um, Why not? Yeah, Babs, yeah, you're taking all this. I, I think it must be linked to that. Like, I also, oh, I, I always feel in these, these, these situations, there's things that there must be things we don't know. There must be. No, there, there, there must be. And, and like, look, City's charges, you can't look past. And I always, and I'm starting to find a few more City fans. They do exist, by the way, my friends. They do. Like, <laughs> they're very few, but they are there. And their argument yeah, always sorry, against is. Parade yesterday. Yeah, yeah, listen, their argument always against the charges is like, um, yeah, well, we know things that you don't. Okay, so what's the thing that you don't know? Like, what, what's, what do I not know? What's the concept? Well, 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 we just know it. I've heard someone from the club say that. It's fi- no, it's not fine. We've seen everyone's got the evidence. It's been leaked to the world. The emails that you were well, sending. So what are the club going to say? Yeah, we're guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah actually. Yeah. yeah, like, do you know what I mean? So obviously, the City is trying to delay it and whatever, but look, it, whether it's going to be relegation, a massive point seduction, it, it, something's going to happen. And ultimately, that's going to hurt Pep the most because he's worked all these years to win all these titles and, and build all this legacy but there's always going to have that massive black mark next to it and in football I look at City almost go they're too good to be true perfectly run they make the best signings they've got the best manager they've got the best goal scorer they've got all this and that there had to be something wrong with it and when you got the charges coming out with it that's that's the black mark and even now to the point where they won four in a row and all the major headlines in, in the UK had one 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 five. you even had Domino's making a financial fair play have you, I'm not sure you saw that. they had like a they what had a said? What? Yeah, they had like a Domino's had like a financial fair, was it financial free pizza. Oh, right. They had like a, yeah, for FFP, right? They, even they're making fun out of it. So everyone knows about Man City's corruption and, and the fact that they've built all of this on something that was obviously fake. So in terms of how I how, how I see Pep now is, look, allegedly. I can see what he's trying to do, <laughs> allegedly, but we know it's not allegedly. We, we've seen the, the evidence. Of Babs, is, we've chemicals. literally seen physical evidence, but look, it is what it is, of course. Allegedly, I don't get a letter from City. Um, <laughs> But look, I, I do believe that this final year for Pep is is perfect for Arsenal and Mikel Arteta more than anything because now you've got a chance to to wave goodbye and win a title because we're so close as it is right now. To win a title in Pep's final year, I think that would be the perfect thing for Mikel Arteta's legacy. And obviously, look, it's still his first of a job. So if you can do that over Pep and then once... Because I think the Chargers will come out anyway. So we could have a, a scenario next year. This is Pep's final year and they could have a massive point deduction. They, they could be on minus 40 points at the start of the season. So they're going to win a title for them. I think at least. We'll be there. Uh, so look, yeah, I, I need that final pep title to be mine. I need it to hurt him because he's hurt me too many times. He has. Um, and Pep will be there next season. He will be there. But Liverpool would have a new manager. Chelsea, yes. sounds like they're going to have a new manager in Enzo Maresca. Newcastle, United. you never know. United will have a new manager. West Ham will have a new manager. Palace have a relatively Chelsea, new manager. Chelsea, Brighton Chelsea, have a new Chelsea. manager. Um... A lot of change, a lot of change in the leagues, but specifically towards the top. How are we feeling, you know, very, very early? Obviously, we'll do more sort of preview stuff close to the time, but sort of the shape of the league and the shape of the Premier League next season. How, 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 who do we feel are challengers? Who do we feel are in that next slot? How do we feel, you know, where are we? I hate that that was potentially a pun. Um, 
the uh, I think that, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll claim it. I'll claim it. I'll claim it. Um, I'm excited. Uh, there's there's so many shifting tides and shifting uh, uh, kind of eras. You know, I think uh, Palace could be on their own villa arc. Personally, oh, I, I really, really am a, a big fan because also their sporting director, Dougie, Dougie Freeman, Freeman. Yep. has, uh, you know, not gone to Newcastle, which is, I think is a huge coup, by the way. And, th- and you know what? I, I love it. Look, the, the one thing that, you know, uh, even with Chelsea getting potentially Maresca, which seems to be done as we've been recording this pod, by the way, um, I think that's a huge thing in terms of McKenna as well. The amount of interest that he's got between both United, Chelsea fighting for him, staying with Ipswich, going to Brighton. There are some really big mid-table clubs, mate, that you mentioned from a European perspective that have all had significant change. Liverpool, United, Chelsea, uh, West Ham. Uh, you know, you're looking at Brighton. New- Brighton. You know, Newcastle, probably the most stable. I don't see Eddie Howe leaving quite yet. But again, their sporting director is leaving in Dan Ashworth. So there's another big background staff portion. Um, look, I, I think that Mikel, it, it's important for me for Mikel to beat Pep. No matter what's happening below us, and I don't want to be rude, but all of that change is happening below our level and below what will affect our ambitions this year, personally. I I do think it's important for Mikel's legacy um, in terms of what he wants to do with Arsenal to beat Pep, personally. Uh, I, I do think it, there will... I don't think it, it should define him, by the way, because beating Pep, people just say, mate, you got to do it. It's so rare. I don't think we end up understanding it. But I will caveat the but. In order to be the special manager that everybody wants him to get the accolades for, I think he has to beat his master. There's too many narratives in that sense that, um, and not that he's owned by him, but in a sense, the person that gave him all the tools and, you know, gave him all the knowledge, which, by the way, is so disingenuous. But the only way he can escape that narrative is by beating him and then after going on to do things that even he hasn't done. And the first step is beating the man. And so I think I think that's important for me, more so than the change in the league. But I, I agree with you. There's there's so much shifting uh, priorities, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, and, and I suppose it's it's really highlights kind of our stability and what we have and you know, having having had the same manager for four or five years and the same sporting mm. director now for well, you know, Edu involved certainly for the last four or five years, sporting director for the last couple. Um, you know, uh, obviously, we've got change with Vinay leaving, but I think Richard Garlic again. It's you know stepping up. It's it's all stability. It's all people that we know at the club. Babs, in terms of where we see, and by the way, Pep is beatable, mate. I was I was watching that team and I was thinking, this is if we can get some transition threat, we can beat this team consistently. And and to, but again, most most people are saying the the point really isn't beating City. We, we we did that in the community. We did it at home. We drew away at the Etihad. That wasn't our problem last season. <laughs> it wasn't. So, you know, I think we can beat City, but it's about beating them in a different way. Um, Babs, in terms of the league itself, uh, so maybe early predictions for how it's going to shake out, where do we see Liverpool? Where do we see Chelsea? Where do we see United, etc.? The mid-table clubs, uh, as George said earlier. I, I think out of the mid-table clubs, <laughs> let's look at Liverpool. There. I think Liverpool is slightly higher than that, but... Yeah. I think Liverpool are the club that I look at that are once again going to be probably the best out of those because they've got the best squad. You know, the quality they have with Trent and Salah and Co. And I think the, their appointment is also probably the best as well. You know, you look at Mariska at Chelsea and I always find Chelsea fans kind of kind of funny because they look at Mikel Arteta and they laugh at it, right? But right now they're going for literally a Mikel Arteta type of manager, a former Man City assistant. So I think their fans, it's going to be intriguing how they do it because they've always kind of laughed at other clubs that go for that type of route and now their club's doing that consistently. So mm. I don't know how they're going to back that manager and how that fan's going to be, fan base is going to be. United themselves, um, I really hope Eric Ten Hag stays. I really, I really do. Oh, I don't know so. if he is gone. Be, I because he listen, is, I haven't I, seen an Ornstein tweet. I haven't seen a Fabrizio tweet just yet. Yeah. So look, I'm, I'm hoping that Eric gets one more year, uh, you know, maybe with Lissandro Fit, they can, they can get high up the league, maybe close to seventh or sixth. Um, we'll see about that as well. But um, yeah, I think Liverpool, the club I'm looking at going, look, Arne Schlott, I think is the most, I think it's the best appointment. I think he's got the most experience and I think the, the, the quality they really have with a bit of reorganisation and a few more signings, I think they'll they'll get close. But I think, you know, look, there's two teams in this league that are more stable than anyone else. They have managers that have been a little more longer than anyone else as well. And, and they are the best in terms of styles of play as well. And mm-hmm. it's uh, Mikel Arteta. I think he's the most him. like complimentary to the philosophy out of everybody yeah, of so far. Um, you know, I'd even argue like McKenna going to Brighton, that's such a change from Deserby's slow buildup. That could be an issue. I look at Chelsea, by the way, going from 
Potch, who effectively was much more transition based, if anything, going to Maresca again, another slow build up player. You look at United, I still don't know who their manager is, to be fair, so I won't make comments on it. But I mean, look at the list, Tuchel, uh, you know, you're looking at Pochettino, you're looking at potentially McKenna, very different build up structures to Ten Hag. And so I do think that, you know, when you look at Arnie Slot, he's actually the most synonymous with his Feyenoord side about counter pressing, um, encouraging the press and having those distances. He's probably the most complimentary manager to taking over a Gagan press from Klopp. So I actually think it'll be the most successful, not just because it's Liverpool, but because they've actually been the only club for me that have recruited to an ideology that's synonymous with the club. And that's important to me. I, I think they had Robert De Zerbi, they had um, Amarim for Chelsea, and they to not choose those two managers and go for Maresca, I think is a huge change to their club. It's never been their club, and I, th- and I worry. I have far more examples of chance managers working out for those that buy into their club ideology than I do for chance managers that don't and somehow break the trend. Really, it's Pep. And then the list is short. Mm. Run a slot. Um, yeah, I think um, also Vinny Company getting the barn job is just it's just, it's just show, it shows the power of the Premier League that a, a guy who got have done relegated. Well. Yeah, this is the thing. Yeah, and this is kind of and this is a conversation for another day. But I think a lot of clubs are just like being like, well, well, let's just do what Man City did, and it's like you can't, you literally mm. can't. So, um, yes, is what it is. Who's where's Fergie's disciples at? I mean, McKenna does he count as well? They're all on sticks of football going, oh, yeah. oh, uh. oh. Uh, lads, pleasure as always. We'll be back on Wednesday for patrons and YouTube members. Um, so make sure if you want to support us on Patreon, etc., you can sign up for a free trial and do that. Uh, thank you for listening if you're on YouTube. Uh, if you're, sorry, thank you for watching if you're on YouTube. Thank you for listening if you're on Spotify and Apple, etc. Uh, we'll be back for more very soon. Lads, pleasure as always and peace. Peace. Peace.